Welcome people from St. Mary's and Anacortes. Nice to see you again. Uh, we're on the church's relationship uh, and, and understanding of divine revelation as seen through the uh, dogmatic constitution of the Second Vatican Council, De Verbum, uh, the word of God. And this morning we talked about <clears throat> the nature of, of revelation. It's possible philosophically, theologically, we talked about human nature and the ability to know and to understand God uh, without faith uh, is human reason and the best of the human condition, a proper means to come to a knowledge of God, even though the knowledge of God might indeed be incomplete, but at least you come to a knowledge of God. Is God and the notion of God accessible to all people, or is it only accessible through divinely inspired prophets I've seen in the life and heritage of Israel. This we have talked about. Now, <clears throat> the question is going to be, as I talked about this morning, uh, can we know God without faith? Can we know God by self-reflection, looking at the universe, making sense of human existence? Can we discover, grow, make sense of, is there a transcendent reality? And is this transcendent reality some sort of abstraction, some sort of animistic principle of life, or is it a deity or deities that are transcendent and wish to communicate and have readily communicated? And what form they, did they take? Well, we read in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 19, that yes, uh, God can in fact be known. Then in Romans chapter 2, verse 14, we have a real important issue about the Jew and the Gentile coming to the notion of God. For the people and land and, and, and heritage of Israel, there is a explicit, dynamic, revelatory self-disclosure of God. That's their heritage. This is what I call the exclusivity symbol. So, for example, what makes one religious tradition or heritage what it is to be? It's the exclusivity. So, for example, in Judaism, we're not dealing with a polytheistic notion of God. You're dealing with a monotheistic notion of God and not some sort of impersonal abstraction or animistic power. No, this deity can be known, has revealed, and offers a relationship that's called salvation. When God reveals simultaneously, he offers himself in a definitive act of communication. Now, how this, how this is expressed will differ in time and in culture, but it is possible. What about the non-Jew, the Gentile, who has not had a explicit, revelatory, divine communication? Are they left out swinging in the wind? By no means, Israel or the religion of Israel recognized readily that yes, God is the God of Israel, but he's also the God of all nations. You gotta keep that in mind. So in Romans chapter two, verse 14, which we covered initially this morning, St. Paul says, when the Gentiles, namely non-Jews, who do not have the Torah, do not have the law, they do not have the explication of divinely revealed truths, who do not have the law, do by nature what the law requires. That's it. That is an incredible Pauline statement that you can do what God demands Israel to do without having the Torah. Well, how do you do that? By the action of grace in the human condition, most specifically within the human conscience. So the human conscience, guided by grace, guided by reason, can come to a knowledge of God. That's incredible. And the Jewish tradition recognized that fact. 
they are, Paul says, they are law unto themselves. So there are two vehicles or avenues by which God is self-expressed, who and what he is in the created existence of the world, divine revelation, and through the things that God has, in fact, created. Creation is dripping with the presence of God. And it's revelatory. In fact, it's so revelatory that the non-Jew has accessibility to this Jewish God, which is a universal God and can fulfill the dynamic reality of this relationship or this call or this election like, like, like Israel. And so they, even though they do not have a law, they are a law unto themselves, okay? No one's left out, okay? You gotta understand that, no one's left out. They show that what the law requires, so the 10 commandments, you know, the uh, 613 bits that's contained within the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they show that what the law requires is written in their hearts while their conscience all bears witness so that basically means that somehow the conscience reveals God. The workings of God by grace, and grace is your participation in the life of God, which he initiates in you. You don't initiate it. He initiates his presence in your life. It's his call, not yours. And you're free to accept that call. You are free to accept that election. You are free to do that. And so Paul wants to say, well, they show that what the law requires uh, is in fact written in their hearts. Now, let's get something straight here. Uh, in our Catholic Christian tradition, we believe that we are born tabula rasa. We are a blank sheet. There are no innate ideas that we are born with. Okay? So what does that mean? Is that we are born in time, in history, with the specificity of human culture, and we are born blank. We have the operations of the soul, I mean, we, the animating reality that causes us to exist. That's what the soul is. The soul is the animating life principle that God gives us. And we are the image of God by having that type of soul. And it is a rational soul, okay? And the operation of a rational soul is intellect and will. You can know, so as the intellect knows the truth, the will, knows what is good. Veracity and the human good. It's a choice and we have the ability to know it. Okay, that's crucial to your understand. Even in our fallen condition, as we talked about this earlier, okay? There are Christians that believe that due to the sin of Adam, uh, we could not know God except by grace and favor. Grace and faith and divine favor. You cannot come to a knowledge of God without faith because the activity of the soul, intellect and will has been so damaged by the sin of Adam that we are incapable of coming to a true knowledge of God. Any knowledge we have of God is revelatory by faith and grace. God's self-disclosure by faith and grace. You cannot come to a knowledge of God naturally. We as Roman Catholics do not hold that. We are not corrupted by the sin of Adam. We are weakened by the sin of Adam. The faculties of intellect and will are weakened by the sin of Adam, but they are functional and human nature alone, human intellect, the ability to choose, the ability to discover, to know, to understand, to make sense of. You can, you can come to a knowledge of God. Okay, uh, and Paul wants to say that uh, 
this has a binding force within the moral conscience. The moral conscience is, is your ability to make a practical judgment on moral issues or on any issue dealing with the human condition. That's what a conscience is. It is a pragmatic judgment of how we are to proceed ethically, morally, in our ability to choose wisely. Paul says, this is how we know God. So the activity of God, the spirit of God, the grace of God, and the charism of faith is given by the activity of the spirit that God elects you and then manifests himself in your conscience to the point that you can discover this God readily and you come to worship him. So this is a major issue. Now, the council makes it very clear that we can come to this, to this notion of God. As I said earlier, the church holds and teaches that God, the first principle and last end of all things, he is the first principle. He is the animating reality that causes existence in everything. The first principle and the last end of all things can be known with certainty. There's a certain amount of certitude that, yeah, we can't know it all, but we know some. From the created world by the natural light of human reason. The natural light of human reason. This is what Paul talks about. You can, you can come to a knowledge of God. Now, the question is going to be, and this is, this is a real issue among Christians, is this natural ability to know God when he infuses grace by this gift of the spirit in the human condition explicitly within the moral conscience? Is that salvific? It's a very important issue. You see, some non-Catholic Christians would hold, yeah, you can come to a knowledge of God, all right. You can grope for him, try to make sense. And even if you come to a, um, like a glimpse of what who and, and, and what God is, that's fine. It's not salvific. You see, that's one thing about revelation, the person of God, the moment God self-discloses in a meaningful, communicative way, he offers himself. Key issue. He offers a relationship. This is not a deity that's obtuse or some sort of general philosophical abstraction. No, he is a God. He's a personal God. Everything comes from him. We bear his image. We bear the stamp of his reality. And by that stamp and by that existence that which is he himself causes, he offers the moment he speaks, the moment he acts, words and deeds, when you hear the word of God and you act on it, that is an act of salvific reality. You're now in a, a profound relationship with God. The moment he self-communicates, he calls you into a profound intimacy, if you so desire. It isn't forced. He elects you. He chooses you. You don't choose him. He chooses you. Now, what you do with that elective choice is your business. You are free. Okay. Uh, there are certain Christians that don't believe that we are that free. We, there's an issue of predestinational understanding of how God works, and your election has nothing to do with you. You are pre elected. And you can't nullify that, uh, that, that election. You can't nullify it. Once God says, You are my elect, it's permanent. So atonement is not universal. It is specified only by God's election. So you are already pre-elected, pre-chosen. 
We in the Roman Catholic tradition do not accept that. Election is free and you have to choose. We are rational, faith-filled human beings. And God honors that part of our human nature that he himself created. And we are free. It's not illusory. It's not a absurdity. It's genuine. So for the Jew, uh, uh, there's only one God. That's it. Now, it is very interesting that in the book of Genesis, chapter 17, we have the call of Abraham. This begins the heritage and religion of Israel. And what is this God like when he reveals himself? Not just to nature or people groping, trying to make sense of human existence and the value of human existence in relationship to this transcendent reality that is the author of all existence everywhere, without exception. And yet this, this all existent reality, this transcendent personalized being always was and always will be. He was never created. He simply exists. That's why when Moses talks to the burning bush and wants to know God's name, ego ami, haye asha haye in the Hebrew. I am what I am. It means self-existence. There has never been anything in or outside of time where God did not exist. God simply exists. His, his being, his essence is to exist, period, in a non-creative form. He was never created. Absolute, pure existence without a beginning. That is God. And that's the God that reveals himself to Abraham. Chapter 17 in Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. It means El Shaddai. I can do all things. I am God Almighty. There's nothing that I cannot do. And he calls you, walk before me and be blameless. I am blameless, namely without any defection. So when you walk with me, you will become like me. And he offers Abram, now called Abraham, because he's the father of nations, many nations. He elects Abraham and his descendants and his children, his tribal uh, affictony, uh, to be his own. I am God. You are my people. You will own the land and you have many descendants. Those are the four Abrahamic promises, uh, promises that is revealed in Genesis chapter 17. It is an act of revelatory self disclosure who and what this God is. And you will have no other God but me. Now at this time, as, as Jewish scholars would say, there was this notion that yes, God is the God that you worship. Now there might be other gods out there, but them you will not worship. So one thing about this Semitic deity, uh, you will not be ignored. Once he self communicates who and what he is and calls you into a relationship, it's like a marital relationship. We are espoused to each other. So there might be other gods, but you are not to worship them. Now, by the time of the book of the prophet Isaiah being written and later in the Jewish prophetic tradition, the notion that there were other gods was just simply deleted. We have strong monotheism. When we have the self-proclamation of who and what God is to Abraham, there's this notion, yeah, there might be other gods, but you will only serve and adore me. But, by, but later in the 
uh, heritage of Israel, the religion of Israel, that changes. The prophet makes a very, uh, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, make it very clear. There's nothing else but God. There are no other gods. And you are forbidden to think that there are, and you are forbidden to worship them. This is absolutely crucial to your understanding of the heritage of Israel. There's no other God. He's the only one. Now this gets into the church relationship with non-Christian religions and the notion of transcendence and other religious understandings of uh, divine activity. But in ancient Israel, uh, no. By the time the book of the prophet Isaiah is written, uh, these deities that you think exist, they do not exist at all. And you will not worship them. The most horrible sin that a Jew could do is to act as if these deities exist. When you read the Old Testament, the Jewish tradition, the, especially the words of the prophetic tradition, Israel um, many times is, is unfaithful to the divine explicit communication about the nature of God and the covenant that God offers us. Again, the moment God reveals, he offers a covenant. He offers a profound, intimate relationship. We're married to each other. That's the imagery. And you're not to go to another uh, uh, deity's bed. Not supposed to do that. That's why in the book of wisdom, chapter 14, there's this whole notion from a Jewish perspective, where did polytheism come from? Where, where, where did these gods come from? How were they created? Because they are a creation, a human creation. They do not exist. So in chapter 14, the wisdom of Solomon, verse 14, for the idea of making idols was the beginning of fornication, namely being unfaithful to the God that has manifested himself. And the invention of them was the corruption of life. God is true, God exists, and anything that is not of God doesn't really exist. And it is a profound corruption of the veracity of who and what God is and the way he has self-communicated. For neither they have existed from the beginning nor will they ever exist, ever. For though to the vanity of men, they entered the world, and therefore their speedy end was, has, has been planned. For a father consumed with grief for an untimely death and untimely bereavement made an image of, of his child, whom he had suddenly taken from him, and is now honored as a God, what was once a dead human being, and handed it on to his dependents, the secret rites of his uh, initiations. Then the ungodly custom grew stronger with time and was kept a law. And the commandment of monarchs, graven images, were worshiped. When men could not honor monarchs in their presence, since they lived at a long distance, they imagined their appearance far away and made visible images of the king whom they honored so that by their zeal, they might flatter the absent one as though present. Then the ambition of the craftsmen impelled even those who did not know the king, to intensify his worship. For he, perhaps wishing to please the ruler skillfully, forced the likeness to take more of a beautiful form. And the multitude, attracted by the, by the charm of his work, 
now regard as an object of worship the one whom shortly before they had honored as a man. And this became a hidden trap for mankind because men in bondage to misfortune or royal authority bestowed on objects of stone or wood the name that ought not to be shared. Afterward, it was not enough for them to err about the knowledge of God. Yes, it is an error about what and who God is, but they live in great strife due to ignorance and they call such great evils peace. So then in chapter 15, verse 13, for this man more than others knows that he sins, he misses the mark. When he makes from earthly matter fragile vessels of graven images. Yeah. For they thought that all their heathen idols were gods, though these neither have the use of their eyes to see or with nostrils which they can draw breath and breathe. No ears to hear, no fingers to feel. With their feet, they cannot walk. For a man made them. The one whose spirit is borrowed formed them. For no man can form a good, for no man can form a God which is like himself. That's their understanding. They don't like polytheism, to say the least. They don't like it. Why? It's false. It's the God illusion. It's the God illusion. God is made in our image. We are not made in his. And we confuse the creator with creation. We, we, we take the beauty found in creation and we make it an idol. Now this gets into all sorts of issues about idolatry, different forms of idolatry. You can have an object that represents God or the deities or whatever, or some animistic spirit. Then you have the language, you know, how do we talk about God? See, I mean, that's the issue because in ancient Israel, words and deeds are co-joined, okay? Now you're always gonna have the issue does language really suffice? Does any human language really suffice to understand who and what God is? Um, is language a, a, a perfect device to clearly explicate and to understand who and what God is? Or is language a fragile human endeavor created by human beings to make sense of, to label, to image, to imagine, to call, to execute how they perceive the universe? Does religious language do justice to God? It's always gonna be a problem. That's why in our Roman Catholic tradition, uh, Theo language, uh, theological language is analogous. It's similar to, it's similar yet dissimilar. Okay, so we have in the document of Vatican II, uh, De Verbum, we read in uh, Article Two, in Chapter One. This plan of revelation is realized by deeds and words having their inner unity. The deeds wrought by God in history of salvation manifest and confirm the teaching and reality signified by the words, while the words proclaim the deeds and clarify the mystery contained in them. By this revelation then, the deepest truth about God and, and the salvation of the human being shines out 
for our sake in Christ, who is both the mediator and the fullness of all revelation. In Article 3, God, who through the word creates all things and keeps them into existence, gives us an enduring witness to himself in created realities, planning to make known the way of heaven's salvation. He went further and from the start manifested himself first to our parents. Then after their fall, his promise of redemption aroused them to hope, to being saved. And then from that time onward, he ceaselessly kept the human race in his care to give them eternal life to, whose, to those who perseveringly do good in search of salvation. Then at time, he had appointed, he called Abraham, again, Genesis chapter 17, in order to make of him a great nation to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and after them through Moses, the law, the Torah, and the prophets, he taught his people to acknowledge himself the one living and true God. Notice not many God, one God. Provident father, just judge, and to wait for the Savior promised by him, and in this manner prepared the way for the gospel dawn to the many centuries. As Catholic Christians, we hold the Christian dispensation or understanding of salvation. Therefore, as the new definitive covenant, okay, will never pass away. And we now await no further new public revelation before the glorious manifestation of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Through divine revelation, article six, God chose to show forth and communicate himself and the everlasting decisions of his will regarding the salvation of all people. That is to say, he, he chose to share with them those divine treasures which totally transcend the understanding of the human mind. And then, as I said before, as the sacred synod has affirmed, namely the Second Vatican Council, God, the beginning and ending of all things, can be known with certainty from the created reality by the light of human reason, but teaches that it is through his revelation that those religious truths, which are by their nature accessible to human reason, can be known by all people with ease, with solid certitude, and with no trace of error, even in the present state of the human race. We can know God. And yes, we, we have to be careful. Uh, knowing God and trying to articulate who and what he is through human speech is always going to be an issue. Is human speech uh, uh, announced to express the totality of revelatory divine communication, obviously not. But words and deeds, again, go back to the Old Testament, go back to the New Testament, words and deeds act as a profound unitive reality that gives us a share in what God is like. So for us Roman Catholics, there is a certainty that we have <clears throat> assured how we understand sacred scripture and the effect of grace and faith in our lives. And yes, there are other Christian denominations that offer another understanding. Karl Barth in the more Calvinistic reformational tradition would say, yes, we can know God, Romans chapter one, Romans chapter two, that is true, yes. Uh, we can know God through things that, that, that come from God. Uh, uh, creation mirrors God. And we can come to a real knowledge of God. 
but, but Karl Barth, a reformed uh, Calvinistic theologian would say, it isn't salvific. It doesn't have the power to say. So you might know something, but that doesn't mean that you have access to the God by election offers you everlasting life. So there is a profound difference in some Christian churches, uh, different from our own Roman Catholic tradition. And then you couple that with, with the religion of Israel. See, Christians believe in the sin of Adam, or what we call original sin. That even though we are born with a, a blank sheet, there are no innate ideas. However, what's innate is the faculty to know. You have to make that distinction, the valid distinction. We are not born with innate ideas given to us by God. However, we are born with the power, the faculty, the capability to come to a knowledge of God, which is innate coming from our rational human intellect. So the intellect is the means by which, the intellect and will is the means by which we encounter this living God. And through empirical discovery in time and in place, we can have a knowledge of God that's genuine. Limited, yes. Can, from our Roman Catholic tradition, is it grace-filled? Is it salvific? We would say yes. Other Christian uh, denominations would, in fact, say no. This is where we differ. But, uh, yeah, in ancient Israel, we are born with the spark of God. And it's a beautiful spark of God. God's presence is in us. <clears throat> but Judaism does not believe in the sin of Adam. We are born sinless. And in time, we develop uh, patterns of behavior that are less becoming of the, um, of the uh, uh, fact of human condition. Uh, it's prone to fall. But Jews do not believe in the sin of Adam. Therefore, we are born sinless. Uh, there is the evil inclination, the good inclination. And through reason and will, we choose. We choose to honor God or not honor God. We choose to know the truth or not the truth. We choose to know the good and do the good and not do the good. We, do, we choose, shall we make an image that justifies our pattern of reality? Or do we not make images and believe in God? That's the whole issue. It's what I call the God illusion. Uh, atheists believe there's no transcendence. And, and that religion is simply a made up understanding of self projection in order to control and understand our own existence. Therefore, God does not exist. It's us. It's self deification. You know. uh, and we need that self validation by honoring who and what we are by elevating those aspects of the human condition that are worthy of such exaltation. So as the uh, Book of Wisdom of Solomon says, yeah, uh, you know, ancestor worship, that began the issue of idolatry. We respected people, we loved them, we did not want them to depart, they died, they were seen in high esteem, and we glorify the human condition and understand it by saying, this person was optimal. This person was exemplary. This person had had a certain existence and reality over and above anyone else. And therefore, he's to be honored and cherished and remembered. And how do we remember? By forming an image. And in time, the image is worshipped. 
and the person for which the image represents is also worshipped. And the author of the uh, uh, Book of Wisdom says, no, you made a mistake. You've worshipped the creature rather than the creator. Idolatry comes from a self-projection, the exaltation of a human being to a level of admiration, exaltation, and then worship. The author of the uh, Song of Solomon says, no, no, no. Uh, you made a mistake. You had the ability and the, and the certitude to understand who and what God is. Creation mirrors God. But you got swept up with the beauty of your own image, deified yourself, and then wanted others to do the same. So we create an image, a theology, a religious expression, creating a whole heritage based on the principle of self-adoration. This is what the author says. It says, uh, yeah, we are made in the image and likeness of God, and we were not to supposed to extend the courtesy back to God. We are made in his image, he is not made in ours. He keeps us going. He is the ultimate existential reality that keeps everything in motion. He alone is to be worshiped. That's why in Genesis chapter 17, I am God and there is no other. I'm El Shaddai, I am the, the God that can do all things and I call you into existence, and I elect you to be my very own people. I will be uh, your God, you will be my people, you will own the land, and you'll have many descendants. That is my blessing, God said. That is my blessing to Israel. And we now have a covenantal relationship, a profound, intimate, elective relationship but I alone shall you worship. You will not worship anything else, either by language or linguistical idol or an idol made of stone, wood, metal, or whatever you have. We love the image, we don't worship it. There's one God, not many. And he is accessible, and he's knowable. Okay, Brian, we now open it up for question and answer. Thank you, Father Jude. You're uh, welcome. Yes, if anyone has any questions, uh, please raise your hand or uh, unmute yourself. If there are no questions, I'll just hand it back to Father Jude. Thank you, Brian. Well, again, just to sum up, for us Roman Catholic Christians, God is knowable, he is accessible, he's a, he is a personal God. He brought you into existence. He sustains you. He will never forsake you. Once you, once you were born, once you came into existence in the mind of God and in earthly reality, you have a supreme dignity in God. We mirror our creator. And in doing so, we honor us as human beings made in his image. And we honor everything that comes forth from him. May this be so this evening. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you everyone for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow. If you do have questions, uh, feel free to email Father Jude at Ronald Jude Eli at uh, gmail.com. Thank you everyone. Good night.